에, 한국말 잘 못해요. 그래서 영어로 이 프레젠테이션은 영어로 하, 하겠습니다. 고맙습니다. Uh, yeah, so as I've said, my name is Kelvin. Nice to meet you, everyone. Uh, good morning. And I would like to just start today by just saying thank you for having us here. And I would love to open the stage in our series of presentations with the talk I'd like to give today. And that is, there we go. It's going to be the metaverse journey, finding your blockchain. I work in Solana Foundation, and this is one of the things that I focus on while working on my day-to-day. -day. So I'd like to share that with you today. When we look at a picture like this, many people might just describe this in the Web3 circles as a metaverse, but it's usually a general term. If we want to be more specific, people start using words like social platforms. Oh, pardon me one second. Social platforms an autonomous world, or an online game. I'd like to focus on that last one, online games, because it's often a complex process to develop. There are many blockchains that people can use to make games with, so how do you pick the blockchain for you? Which one do you choose? My little remote is uh, a little slow today. It needs coffee. Oh. All right. Well, since we're missing a slide, I will simply just state that one of the important things about making a blockchain is that you can use any tool and any blockchain to make a game. But blockchains are not the same. They're all different in their own ways. And that is OK. Many games are different, too. And you need to use the right tool for the job. To choose the right tool, you need to make sure that it fits the characteristics of your games to save you some trouble from picking the wrong one. So we're going to talk about three different flavors of blockchain gaming today. And we're going to start with the most basic one and go all the way to the most advanced one. With the most basic one is one we are all very familiar with, and that is on-chain assets only. These are assets that you can trade outside of the game. You can take a sword, put it on a marketplace. You can also mutate the tokens in other apps. So you can take another application and modify your sword in a different one that is not the game. You can also expose the money in the game to be used in the real world. And you can use basic user-generated content by associating in-game activities with a specific token or NFT. The evolution of this is something called a hybrid on-chain game. And in the hybrid on-chain game, it has all of the features of the online assets with the on-chain characteristics, aside from also having an API hook that allows other games or other applications to talk to the game's data in real time. That allows us to create companion apps. You play a game in your PlayStation, and you can have an application in your smartphone that reacts and is connected to it. In the same way, you can make two separate games that talk to each other. An explosion in one game can be an earthquake in another. And we have complex user-generated content, because the data that the user generates is now on the blockchain, not specifically part of the game. You can do many more things when it is not limited to what happens in the game. The most cutting edge version of this is going to be the fully on-chain game. And this is the next generation where blockchain gaming is headed towards. With fully on-chain games, we can enable players to change the rules of the game. We can also make the game live online forever because it lives on the blockchain, it does not live on a server. And if you set it up right, the players and the game developers together can build the world, not just the game developer. I want to give you all an example of this in a visual perspective. So today we're going to do a little exercise. I want to take my favorite game that is a Web 2 game and transform it to a Web 3 game. 
and I'm going to choose Monster Hunter. This game is, for those who don't know, a game about running through different maps and hunting different monsters, collecting items, and then creating and crafting more advanced items to hunt more advanced monsters. In a game like this, you need items, so I want to start there. When you go to the item shop in the game, you have to purchase items with in-game currency. This is the most standardized way that most people are familiar with in Web3 Gaming. We can just take the currency and make a fungible currency on a blockchain. As a game designer, you have to think about what this means. In Monster Hunter, when I want to make a purchase, I need to consider how long it takes to make the purchase of my item. If it takes too long, it's a bad user experience. I'm going to decide to only use six seconds or less to make my transactions. This is still not really good, but at least it keeps my options open of choosing many different blockchains to build my game with. One thing I can do is instead of buying one item at a time, I can do a shopping cart and buy everything after I make my selection. The good thing about Monster Hunter is the money doesn't change very much. Zenny is the in-game currency of Monster Hunter, and you only get it usually when you finish a hunt or when you're doing some shopping. So if those two places are the only places where it really happens, I can optimize only there, which means I can hide the six seconds in between the loading screens after I'm done hunting and going to the shop. These are game design techniques that designers have to think about because blockchains are not as fast as private servers, even though they give us all these benefits. So what about the items? This is a different class of tokenization that we have to use. Semi-fungible tokens. I can have 10 potions. I can have one set of 10 potions or each individual one. With a semi-fungible token, I need to be able to make different classes of those items and put them all across the world. That's a lot of items. But the most important part is using the item. And when you have a transaction time that is six seconds, you cannot expect to heal yourself with the item and avoid damage at the same time. This is very critical for a game like Monster Hunter. So even though with the currency I can hide it, with the items, it's very difficult to do this. If I try to hide it, I might become unsynchronized from the blockchain. So faking it is tricky, is dangerous. What happens if the transaction fails? How do I fix my game after that? The best thing I'm going to choose to do as a designer is just make sure that I can do it within one second. And that reduces the block changes that I can use. Lastly, the equipment is probably what many of us here are familiar with with NFTs. It's just your standard NFT with metadata that's associated to it. The only detail is that in Monster Hunter, you also have decorations. And those could be other NFTs as well. So I want to use a composable NFT standard. There are many options out there, but this is what I need. Lastly, the details about equipment is that there is a factor that is constantly changing while I'm hunting. And that is the weapon sharpness. Every strike I make lowers my sharpness and I need to go hide and use items to restore my sharpness or restore my teddy bear. So when we use these kind of items, we need to be able to do it quickly like the potion. But the sharpness changes so frequently, I cannot even wait for transactions. Maybe we can put this data on the metadata of the NFT. We have to get creative here. The technology is still evolving. So assuming we solve all those problems, we now have, congratulations, a Web3 version of Monster Hunter World. We have the money, the items, the equipment, and the player accounts on the blockchain. And game clients and game servers can talk to the blockchain to get the data. They don't have to just depend on the game server. And you can have third-party apps, like the smartphone example I just mentioned. So what does hybrid 
on-chain game look like then? This is a map that you kind of see when you're going to start a hunt. Imagine my friend is going to play Monster Hunter in his house on PlayStation. I want to know when he's going to play. Maybe I want to play with him. So I decide that I want to be notified anytime he is playing. Because the data might be on the blockchain, I can make my own smartphone app and then load the data myself. I can also add other features to this app. For example, I can wait for my friend to play and then see what is happening while that hunt is going on and search around the world. But I also want to see his items. Maybe I realize my friend is not well equipped. I must go save him. So I can use this app to see what my friend is doing or when he is going. It's not Twitch. He's not streaming. He's just playing his game. And I'm able to read the same data. Somebody gets inspired by my app. And maybe they decide to open up a website using the same features because the data is public. It's on the chain. Anybody can read it. I get inspired, and I run to my refrigerator, and I load up the same app to watch my friend. All of this is possible when you can have safe access to public data that lives in the same place. So this is kind of what it looks like. Nothing much changed. We took features from the game server, and we moved them onto the blockchain. Things like quests, like hunts, they're just systems that already existed. They just exist somewhere else on the chain as a program, as a smart contract. So then what does a fully on-chain game look like then? Well, here's the easy part. It looks the same. It's just more of it. In fact, it's all of it. Take every system in the game and deploy it to the blockchain. And you have a fully on-chain game. But the power of fully on-chain games is actually what comes with the ecosystem of the blockchain. When you remove the game server, because the game server's features are already on the blockchain, then players can just connect directly to the blockchain to play as well. They can use features that have been moved to the blockchain, like matchmaking, and connect to each other directly when they decide who they're matched with. The blockchain systems usually have things like governance and treasuries and other tokens and items, decentralized autonomous organizations. We can use these tools to create digital governments that can help develop the game. So the game can run on its own, and you can have a government of people that decide how the game evolves over time. And that's it. That's a fully on-chain game for Monster Hunter instead of just a simple client and server. So if I want to build this, I have a wish list of features that I want my blockchain to have. If I'm going to build only the basic version of on-chain assets, I need to make it very cheap to mint tens of thousands of tokens. It needs to be extremely cheap because the items keep getting created, destroyed, transferred, and there's so many to keep track of. If you want to evolve the game, you might have even more items. And you also need sub-second transaction finality. My transactions need to happen in less than a second, because otherwise, how do I use my potions while I'm getting attacked? If I'm going to build the hybrid on-chain games, then as a game developer, I do not want to start over. I spent five, 10 years making my game. I do not want to write all the logic again to put it on a blockchain. I want to use the code that I have built and modify it so that it can live somewhere else. So I need to be able to be familiar with the programming languages and the tools so I can move it very quickly and get to go on the game into the market much quicker. And lastly, for the fully on-chain game, I need an existing security pool. I need a network that just lets me deploy the game. Making a blockchain network is expensive. It is challenging. That is why we have all these different blockchain networks of dedicated people building these communities. It is a very challenging task. And games are also a very challenging task. Those are two big projects. And we want to make a game. We need to focus on one. And I just want free transactions. I don't want people to have to pay for what I want to do. I just want to be able to do it and do it safely. But there are things that I cannot accept. As a game designer, I cannot accept one of the features 
in blockchain, which is called a blockchain reorg or a fork. This is a feature for security, for stability of a blockchain system, for decentralized systems that need to get back into sync once they fall out of sync. What this means for a game developer is that if all my transactions on the red line suddenly get abandoned because the blockchain is going off a different path now, then I need to rewind my game. How far do I rewind that game? There are systems like GGPO, Good Game, Peace Out. There are technology stacks that let us reverse some frames in a game, very popular in fighting games. But this only helps us recover one second. A block, two blocks, might be five minutes of gameplay depending on which blockchain you use. The best way to avoid the problem is to just not be exposed to it. So I need to find a blockchain that simply does not do the thing that blockchains do. That's kind of hard. And one of the other more important things is all I need is a blockchain for this. If I am using my logic to put it on a blockchain for everybody to have access for the tokens, for the game, for the logic, I need to make sure that blockchain is useful to me. If I have to do all the different techniques and approaches to scale and evolve the blockchain system, maybe I'm not picking the right tool for the job and I should reconsider what I'm starting with. So which blockchain do I choose? I think with all of these, the one that makes sense to me today, I'm gonna to start with this one. So why do I pick Solana to start with this project? Going through the wish list, one of the things that Solana has is compressed NFTs. And if you think of how cheap it is already to have NFTs in Solana, imagine if you can compress them and have millions and billions of them for an actual affordable price. This is something that is essential for a game that I don't know how many items it will have as it evolves. Subsecond transaction finality, one of my favorite things to do is go to the Solana Blockchain Explorer and actually watch transactions in real time pass. When I go to Etherscan or some other blockchain, I have to sit there and wait for the next block to see what exciting changes happen on the blockchain. With this one, I get to see every single second that happens, and it never usually goes above uh, 600 milliseconds. That's like the highest. Usually it stays around 400. So it's a pretty dynamic uh, throughput. With the familiar programming language, Rust is a very popular programming language in blockchains, but programming in games has traditionally been a C++ code base. And the cool thing about Solana is I can use both. And it's not just limited to that. There are some excellent C-sharp developers right now building Unity SDK integrations into Solana like the Magic Blocks SDK. And this just goes to show that if you have a tool that you like using in game development, it's very probable that you already have the tools to build it in Solana. So the existing security pool. This is something all blockchains really provide. This isn't special to Solana. We go to a blockchain to deploy our program so that people can buy the tokens, trade it, they can participate in the logic and the governance. And that's exactly what I need. I only need to a system that's already deployed so that I can just use it. I do not want to customize the entire network. I could make my own special Monster Hunter blockchain, but again, that is so much work if I can already use an existing platform that gives me fast transactions and it gives me a wealth of flexibility with development tools. This last one is a contradiction. Uh, you really can't have that. No, it, this, is, this is actually pretty hard to get. Free transactions without security compromise. For those who know, the fees are meant to be there for security purposes. If a blockchain has no fees, it gets abused, it gets overloaded. So I think about this and I say, well, if I can't have free transactions, then, then why do I wanna use this network? Maybe I should make my own network. The reality is that in life, because nothing is free, you're either going to pay with work or you're going to pay with money. And if you don't pay with work, and you don't pay with money, then the people that are running that network are going to want to get compensated. 
So they will be motivated to make it private and charge you for access anyway. So I have to accept the reality and then choose the alternative. And the alternative is, I just want it to be affordable. I just want it to not cost me or anyone much of anything, and it can be decentralized so it can live on. Well, just like how Ethereum has relay networks to avoid paying gas fees for users, Solana has a, system, a similar system. It's called Octane. On top of that, Solana enjoys some of the lowest transaction fees in the market today. So I feel pretty confident starting here, knowing that my game is gonna continue evolving and the prices won't be as volatile. But let's say my game becomes a huge success, massive success, and I, I don't have enough money to afford all these transaction fees because the game gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, Solana's working on a lot of technologies, one of them being state compression, which allows me to make the game that I have and still compress it into an amount that I can afford to operate on again. So if I'm very careful with how I develop things, my game can run for a very long time, longer than I might be alive for. This is actually the kind of technology that allows compressed NFTs in the first place. So there's ongoing developments here as well. So this is kind of where I'm going to start. But in reality, I'm not worried about the future because my vision of Web3 is that everything is connected eventually. All protocols will be able to talk to each other some way. So the most important part is, where do you start today? Which tool do you use to start your project? So I'd like to hear what you will be deciding on and what you will be choosing. And I hope we can discuss that over today. That's all I have for you today and this morning. And uh, thank you for having me. Thank you.